Hello, my name is Alexander Mironov. I'm the manager of Electron Microscopy Core Facility in the University of Manchester. Today, I'm presenting another lecture from our seminar series, Wednesday EM Talks, that covers principles and methods of electron microscopy that are used in our facility. Today's topic is stereology or how simple to count things in EM. Um, so today I'll talk about stereology or how simple it is to count things in EM. It's not very obvious. It's not very um, um, simple, actually. Uh, if, if, but if you know the the um, principles, then it's, it's it's quite okay. So, <clears throat> what what do we, what do I all talk about? First, I will describe the problems um, uh, with three D structures in two dimensional images, which we usually see at TM level. Uh, then I'll uh, tell a bit of history of stereology and uh, I'll make now David Smith uh, co-host think just to back me up um, so then I'll describe the probes which should be used and are used in uh, in a three-dimensional space um, to count structures in three-dimensional space and talk about unbiased sampling and how to actually how physically you count the things and with the computer of course and uh, then <clears throat> how stereology can help even in the three-dimensional world, world itself okay let's uh, no, next one so what is stereology um despite the uh, this kind of spelling stereo it has nothing to do with stereo vision at all uh, stereology is statistical methodology to estimate geometrical quantities of three-dimensional objects, uh, usually from two-dimensional representation. And stereo is derived from Greek word for geometric object. And in practice, it's just a toolbox, uh, tools like probes, like principles, uh, uh, sampling techniques uh, to obtain three-dimensional information from measurements made on two-dimensional uh, sections. It could be sections from microtomes, it could be even geological sections. It's actually developed was mat by material scientists and mathematicians uh, uh, in the 20th century and uh, it was introduced into biology to quite wide applications by uh, two famous theologists, uh, Hans Jorgen Huntersen and uh, Luis Maria Cruz Arriva in the 90s. It was like a golden age when a lot of papers were coming out about stereology. Uh, unfortunately, Hans already died this, this I think, March. It was very sad. He was a really great guy. Um, so, can you just count things in two-dimensional sections? Because it's quite easy. You have a section, you have a structure, just count how many things you have in, in the area, and that's it. And it's not so obvious, actually, because all two-dimensional sections are parts of three-dimensional objects. And looking at two dimensions, you're losing quite a lot of information from 3D in, in height. Uh, and two-dimensional sections could be quite deceitful in this regard. And if, if you're seeing things in 2D, you're actually making an assumption how it's arranged in three-dimensional space. And not necessarily that your, your assumptions are correct. So that's the first example. Uh, in, in the bottom, we can see the section of a round structure. But this structure can be belonging to any of that uh, geometrical shapes. And you have no idea if you don't have fully uh, like uh, completely cut um, in serial sections, uh, object completely cut in serial sections about its three-dimensional shape uh, or any other features. Uh, second example is that if you imagine this like three-dimensional space and you have different um, level of two-dimensional sections and you try to count on all the sections number actually get the wrong number because if you count intersections like in in blue or in, in uh, pink you can have uh, if you co collect everything uh, all data on all sections you result the end result will be 15 blue nuclei and 14 uh, pink nuclei and that is not correct because actually you have nine 
<clears throat> blue nuclei and 13 pink nuclei. So when you're counting things in 2D, you're introducing so much bias that actually you're doing, you are estimating uh, in, uh, things in the wrong way. And all assumption-based, model-based methods are, are, are pre pre nineties. Mostly, they they have um, their roots in um, um, in the field which was not actually touched by stereology at all. Um, then there's some other uh, considerations. What else could go wrong with this two-dimensional section? Because these two examples are not only the problems you can meet with two-dimensional structures. So even when you have ideal sphere, if you cut ideal sphere, and it's not usually the case, even in this case, you can't estimate its size properly because in most of cases, your section do not go through the uh, widest diameter of a sphere. And when you <clears throat> averaging the, the round objects in your sample on 2D, you're actually hugely underestimating the actual size. It's not the only thing that can go wrong in, in that panel as well. If we imagine that you want to count the number, number of numerical uh, density, a number of some of something of, of your structure in the cell or in the area, um, uh, you'll have, um, you'll get the very interesting uh, feature of three-dimensional space that if you have a bigger object, then it has much higher probability to be cut. So that is uh, depicted here. So you have a lot of sections coming through three objects and you can see that the big structure uh, have considerably more sections going through than the small structure. Meaning if you just go into count numbers, you have, you un overestimate big structures and underestimate uh, small structures. And that problem could be solved only with stereological method. You can't solve it just with one section and counting things in it. So um, stereology is a um, method which is based on geometrical probability theory. And uh, this is a slide about a bit of history. It's not a lot, but I'll just briefly describe uh, the historical background. Uh, First, mathematics was introduced to geom. I mean, high-end mathematics was introduced into geometry and 3D geometry by uh, Ventura Francesco Cavalieri in 17th century, and uh, he based his um, estimation of volume on exhaustive sectioning of of, of uh, something um, with a infinitely small um, distance between sections. It's actually principle of calculus. And uh, that methodology I'll talk uh, about a bit later. It has kind of some really brilliant combinations with uh, other methods to estimate volumes. Uh, then actual father of uh, uh, prob probability, uh, probabilistic geom geometry is actually the um, John, uh, George uh, Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon, and uh, uh, he has interesting, he posed the interesting problem, de Buffon needles uh, problem, I'll talk uh, later on the next slide, and he discovered connection between geometry and probability, and um, uh, it will be later. So, <clears throat> uh, there are other people who are actually involved in that, like uh, a French person, French geologist uh, André de Lisset, um, August Roosevelt from Austria, and uh, Russian guy Glagolov and uh, uh, English scientist Thompson, actually done quite a lot for uh, uh, for present stereology uh, because they 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 they, they made the basic. Uh, make a basic uh, transition from uh, volume to point counting. And that is amazing because it's much easier to count points than draw anything and try to trace uh, structures on, in 2 or 3D. So the LSA principle is uh, stating that the <clears throat> areas of structures in two-dimensional sections are directly proportional to their volumes. 
Uh, the next step was done by Roosevelt, and he said that you don't need to trace all these volume or areas. Actually, you can just put random lines, measure, the, measure them, and uh, they will be proportional to the volume. And uh, <clears throat> Glagolov uh, and uh, uh, Thompson, they made the next step and introduced the points because they're saying if, if you even just count points, not lines, not uh, areas, but points uh, with certain distance between them, then the number of points uh, between structures, total uh, structure and uh, specific structure will be proportional to the volumes as well. And uh, uh, another contribution was done by uh, material scientist Soltikov, uh, which um, <clears throat> developed, well, uh, he has developed the uh, surface area and length estimation from, from two-dimensional sections. So let's talk about before Neil's problem. Um, it's quite interesting thing because it shows how geometry uh, plays a major role in counting in 2D. So the, the, the uh, I'll try to start, yes. So the, 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 the task, the, the problem is itself is that um, if you have a floor uh, with, with strips of wood and we shall have the same, same distance between them like here, and you drop a needle on the floor, then what is the probability that this needle will lie across a line between two strips? And it's qu quite quite a theoretical thing, but uh, if you go to uh, mathematical formulas, which are here, they're not complicated. I'm, I'm not a mathematician, I don't like formulas, but this, they're quite, quite uh, simple here. So if you have needle length of that black needles, and you have uh, this, the width of the strip, distance between these lines, then the probability will be um, equal of, um, number of hits to the number of total tries of needles which just rolled on this floor and uh, that is actually equal to the double length of needle divided uh, on, on the <clears throat> pi multiplied by distance between the lines and if you you can see there is um, there are a lot of uh, there's some interesting features in this formula so one of the Amazing uh, consequence for myself is actually the, from the, the just from dropping the needles on the floor, you can estimate number pi. <laughs> it's it's amazing because uh, I have actually an app macro for ImageJ, and you can try yourself if you want. I can send it to you. But if you have enough throws of needles on the floor, you can find that the pi is just the standard 3, 14, 15, and so on. Uh, if you go a bit further on, which is more close to stereology estimating uh, sizes and, and in this case length, then to find, <clears throat> if you imagine that the needles themselves can be actually joined in a contour like that, this contour length could be estimated by um, counter intersections of, of that contour with the test lines. And if we get this length of a needle from that formula, it will be equal to the probability uh, on, multiplied by this um, pi distance and divided by two. And if you go a bit further on, uh, instead of probability, you can use the intersections, the number of times where the test lines intersect with your length. So, uh, this example based foundation, so we see the geometry solves actually can find out exactly how how long your line, how long your contour of uh, of any uh, actually it could be of any configuration, any shape. Space has three dimensions, and of course, objects has three dimensional features in it. And uh, as you can see here, you can have volume, you can have a surface like, like a plasma membrane, a membrane of any organelles, you can have a length for some um, things, microtubules or collagen fibrils. And of course, uh, there is a, another feature called number. It's, it doesn't have any dimensions, it's zero dimensions, it's just like, like dots. Uh, we, how many of kind of, of one kind of stuff inside certain volume. And all of these features uh, can be estimated by stereological methods. So, um, 
measuring three dimensional objects in two dimensional sections. You can't measure in most of cases in EM directly in 3D um, because it's just practically impossible. But also, uh, even in, in light microscopy, if you don't have good uh, algorithm for uh, automatic segmentation, then you, you, you can't reconstruct it uh, automatically. So you need to measure something, but if you're measuring even in 3D, you need to do uh, it properly. And um, for EM, the measurements are usually made on, uh, measured down on two dimensional sections. Uh, I'm talking about, of course, mostly routine TM with tissues, cells, uh, cell biology related TM. So when you cut these three dimensional objects with one plane, with two dimensional plane, uh, you transform, transform the uh, three dimensional features into two dimensional features. So volume becomes uh, area. Uh, the surface becomes line and the length becomes just intersections between the long structure and, 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 the, and the plane of section. And to, you need to have a, a proper probe to convert two dimensional structures back to uh, three dimensions. And in here, they have a quite nice diagram in, in the form of table that uh, shows you which probes to use in which case. So for three-dimensional, for, for volume thing, you need to use points. And you have 3D for volume and points have zero dimensionality. So in total, they form three dimensions. For surface estimation, two dimension, you need to use lines, one dimension. in, in total it's three dimensions again and the same thing for length you are summing up the uh, long feature with a plane and the number number has zero dimensionality uh, but for number you need to use volume so it's a bit uh, separate from all other uh, uh, probes because you, you can't use only one section here so um, so this is just summarizing, this table is summarizing uh, that uh, parameters and the test probe should have together the dimensionality of three or more. And um, <clears throat> that is the, the, the formulas which are used for estimation for volume, surface area, length, and number. And they, they have a special depiction and a special name because uh, what you do when you count the points uh, and relate points to um, bigger structure, which are again covered by points, you, you are, are determining not the volume itself, you're determining the fraction of volume. And uh, the name for that is a volume density. And that line actually uh, showing you uh, the development of Delacy, Glakolov and um, uh, Roswell. So we're going from volume to area. This is the Lissi principle from area to length, uh, intercepts, it's uh, uh, Roswell principle. And then from length to, to, uh, to the points, points counting, this is the goal of and, and, and Thompson development. Um, and then uh, this concerns about the uh, surface area where you can count intersections between test lines and the uh, profile of your surface. And then you can see that it's actually very close to, to the Debuffon needles problem. Uh, for length, it's quite simple. You have test planes, you have intersections, you just count them and relate to the area that gives you length density in the same way like volume has volume density, surface area has surface density, length has length density. So it's a re relation to the uh, re reference, so-called reference volume. And for number, uh, as I said, you need not one, but at least two sections or maybe more. So, uh, a second, here we are, uh, did it in the wrong way, but uh, <clears throat> in the wrong sequence. What we have here, <clears throat> we have a representation of a cell, and I'll just show how to calculate the volume, uh, volume density, of course, uh, if, if you don't have reference volume, uh, we're using points. In general, you just put the grid where the intersections of the grid conform the points. So you can just draw the points with the, with the crosses or any other things and uh, relate number of uh, points, points over the structure 
of interest to the total number of points hitting the structure, reference structure. And that gives you the volume density, in this case, to saying if it is nucleus, then you have 28% of volume in the cell occupied by the nucleus. It's a pretty good thing because uh, it gives you the understanding how things are related inside the reference volume. And uh, the beauty of all these uh, test systems and um, in combination with sampling, which I'll talk um, further on on next slides, is that there are nothing, no assumptions are made about the object you're studying. So you don't have any assumptions about shape, about size, about orientation or distribution. You go with a not model-based method, but, but with a design-based method. You design a method which uh, doesn't have any assumptions at all. So to um, estimate structures properly, you need not only accuracy, but efficiency as well. What do I, do I mean? That uh, uh, <clears throat> the estimator, the method, special method called estimator, estimator of volume, of uh, volume fraction, anything, it should be not only accurate, this is just a representation that it could be accurate or inaccurate, so be around the center of your target, but as well, it should be unbiased because if you have very precise and very accurate uh, estimator, but it's biased, so you'll hit the wrong place and it will be, could be accurate or inaccurate, but it's still be in, in a wrong place. And uh, in, in reality, there's practically no way you can determine the bias because you don't have the targets drawn on your objects. And that is the diagram, the, the graph uh, of um, uh, estimation of something, like saying it could be volume or anything, a number, uh, with a unbiased estimator and biased estimator. You can see that they're both quite accurate, but uh, the, ac the unbiased actually come, uh, goes to the true value bias estimator will never go to the true value. It's all, you will have always a bias called B here, and it, it is invisible in your in the data set. You can't, you can't determine it. There is no formula for that. And you have just numbers, but you don't know is it biased or not. So the only way to, uh, to fight with the bias is to use unbiased methods. And bias can derive could be from wrong calibration of your instruments. It could be observer effects. If you select something preferentially, you can have incorrect assumptions about uh, how your structures organize the space or how what the shapes of, of the structure it is. It is. Uh, you can have a wrong sampling or you can select it. You have because you can't assess a full uh, population use selection part of a population usually. And if you're selecting in the wrong way, then of course you'll have biased results. So uh, what we need to do, we need to avoid assumptions with correct sampling. And if you do sampling in not correct way, nobody can help you in, in later stages because you will have some, probably some bias. You never know, do you have it or not? So one of the ways is to have just random section somewhere in space, and that's called random sectioning. In addition, you need to have, it's not only randomly spaced, placed, but as well isotropic, so there is no any preferential orientation of your sample. Very often, uh, if you imagine so in human body or, or animal body, uh, you can't, you can't, uh, recognize very often the structures, these organs or, or, or tissues, if they're cut in very strange, at very strange angle. Some um, some um, organs like vessels, like brain, uh, uh, gut, they have they should be cut in certain way, like perpendicular to the long long axis, so you can recognize structure features and structures in it. And uh, <clears throat> to 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 compensate for that. Uh, there is a special way of uh, putting sections called vertical sections, where you, you fix one axis around which you can rotate your section freely. You can shift it, rotate it, uh, but uh, uh, one of the axes is 
uh, fixed. Uh, of course, because of that, some of the probes should be modified, um, yeah, but it's possible. So nothing is lost, even if you, even if you need certain uh, um, uh, orientation of a sample. Also, uh, if you just put things randomly, if you take uh, your, uh, your your sampling from flesh in, in any random uh, random positions, you you can have a problem that your randomness is not great. Some you can have hits of very densely populated areas or not very densely populated. You can get into some kind of resonance, and to fight with this, is the best way to uh, best efficient way to use it. It will not introduce uh, or the, uh, remove the bias, it will just reduce the standard deviation, uh, reduce errors, standard errors, is to use so-called system, random systematic sampling. Um, it means that you're testing your population at, uh, at some, uh, at some, or the probes at some distance, known distance, regular distance, regular, regular <clears throat> but the, the beginning, the start of your, of your, um, um, putting probes on your sample should be random. So by putting the first first probe randomly and then all other probes are related to this first probe in a regular manner, you actually increasing very much the efficiency of, of the uh, estimation. And uh, <clears throat> in the stereology, all these principles are called like isotropic uh, uniform random sections or vertical uniform ra random sections and that is the kind of ideal situation to which you need to to um, to need to aim for that situation that you have either as a tropic random uniform random or vertical sections uh, then uh, another thing comes um, uh, with the sampling is that with all microscopy and especially with electron microscopy, you can't study the whole organism. You can't study a full organ because it's too big. So the organ should be divided from very small parts in you know, blocks and sections in the fields of view. And then you you act, you, you uh, present it with a present it with, with with a strange not not strange but a, with an important choice. Well, how to increase the efficiency of this sampling, which part of, of, of this quite complicated sampling methodology you should uh, concentrate to make your, 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 your sampling very efficient. And that was uh, uh, tried and estimated by this well-known stereologist like uh, Hans Kuntersen and Cruz Arriva. And they found that actually the best, the best policy to, to, for, for uh, sampling is, as they call, do more, less well, because 70% of um, variation in anything and structures and uh, quantities are inter-individual, between individuals. So if, if, you, if you're um, saying, try to um, increase your efficiency just counting more structures in the same section to have more fields uh, have more sections you probably will increase your results the the quality of your results by two or three percent but if you add another animal two animals or three animals you increase your efficiency your uh, accuracy much 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 bigger scale so try not to go to small thing concentrate on big ones to so, if you don't have enough significance, you don't have enough uh, uh, accuracy, just try to get more animals, maybe more blocks, depending on the organ, of course. And uh, don't spend time on counting thousands of points. It, it has no sense at all. So uh, let's try, I'll show you how to uh, do this um, in, in practice, not in practice, just demonstration, how you count, uh, how you estimate volume fraction, how you estimate surface fraction. So imagine you have a, a cell with a grid, and then you want to estimate the volume fractions of organelles, some could be mitochondrial, lysosome, or whatever, and nucleus. And what we do, you have, you're putting the points in the total area of the cell, 
I have this, I think it's 21 point there. Then you uh, count how many points hitting nucleus, how many points hitting the organelle, and in the end you have a uh, fraction, volume fraction of nu nucleus or organelles could be nucleus is 28%, uh, the organelles 14% of the total volume. And if you have <clears throat> volume or reference is established, uh, volume or, or, or reference space established by some other methods, uh, which I will not describe, but there are a lot of them, then you can have even uh, total volume, absolute total volume, not fraction, but uh, absolute numbers. Uh, for the uh, surface area, we need to again to go uh, a bit to the formulas because uh, the surface area is determined by intersections uh, uh, divided, double intersection divided by the length uh, of, a, of a line, but <clears throat> We don't need to determine the length of line because in the grid you have, um, especially if you have uh, lines and points. For each point, you can have certain you have certain distance which belongs to this one point, meaning that if you have uh, counting the points and line length of this distance, uh, and here you can see that for one point there are always two. In, uh, two lines belong to one point. It's not not one because you have two times more lines than, than points here. Then you can convert that uh, uh, that that number in in this double distance. And what you do in the end, you count intersections and divide it by total points hitting the object. And uh, uh, you can have a relation. You can have a surface uh, related to a volume of a total cell or related to the volume of just a structure you want to determine the surface. And uh, that is how it's done. So you, you, you go to your lines, count the intersections between nucleus and the lines uh, here, and then count the intersections between the lines and uh, uh, your organelle. In the end, you put numbers into the formula and we rel relate the uh, uh, surface density to, in this case to the volume on total cell and in the end you have uh, that number d still remains because i didn't put number didn't put the the, uh, uh, the, the um, number what what d is but if you put like one micron then it will be 0.76 um, uh, micron square divided by the volume of one <clears throat> micron so uh, the relation of of uh, my, micron in uh, uh, negative minus one is because you're dividing surface, which is two, uh, by the volume, which is three, dimensionality. So you're actually getting minus one because the microns is below the division line. So that is the surface uh, density. Again, if you if you have a surface density and you can estimate the reference volume, you can estimate the uh, total uh, absolute surface. Uh, number density estimation is impossible on a single section because you have, <clears throat> for, for number, you need to have the probe which adds up to 3D, meaning that you need to have a volume. Uh, again, it likes to define the reason, yeah? you, you want to have uh, two-dimensional sections that d d d uh, determine the things on them. But in, in this case, there is no um, uh, bypass of this problem, but uh, you, you can make it a bit simpler. You can use two serial sections. And the way it's done, it's called the dissector, the, this methodology. It's published in 1984 uh, by uh, Stereo, and this is actually a pseudonym. Uh, it's, it's an interesting story here uh, because the uh, real author is actually Hans Gundersen and he put the pseudonym like, you know, the criterion of st student in, in uh, statistics. Uh, uh, not to say his name with this methodology because he uh, kind of paying respect for his teacher and uh, one of the greatest uh, statisticians, Thompson, who was developing um, in his notes, not published uh, the, the, the principles of that dissector. So what, what does it consist? It has two sections, the top one and the bottom one. And they, the section uh, across the structure, <clears throat> has the structure to the 
profiles. And you have so-called look down plane and look up plane. And what you do, you try to count between two, these two serial sections, uh, how many new structures appears. So if you do it from look down to look up, means that you have you have one structure if if, if that structure is the same like uh, f number five probably it's not then you have uh, only one structure on two, two structures appearing so from look down section to look up you have number one appearing number five appearing and uh, that is the principle of the sector you assign the uh, to, to this three-dimensional uh, structures in the volume, you assign just the numbers, the dimensionless uh, parameter. So you count the only when they appear. And that goes to this formula when you have the, uh, the, the num numerical density, it's number of structures you count related to the uh, area where it is, they are count, counted and to the thickness between sections. And usually it's, it's known. In this way, you can see how many structures appearing, how many structures are in this volume. And it could, it could be done both ways from look up to look, 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 look down to look up or from look up to look down. So in this way, you actually, uh, in statistical terms, you, you duplicating the volume, you have twice the volume and you need to compensate for that. Uh, so if you go in only one way, you have two structures. If you go in two ways, we have, uh, uh, so this is the same and only that structure appears. We have one structure. So in average, uh, you, you um, have a th three structures for double volume. So one point half structure in that, uh, volume, for example. Uh, uh, another note is that you can see that there are two cubes there, right? So that internal cube and that external one. Externals usually uh, represent the section itself. And that internal one is a very important principle called uh, unbiased counting frame. And what, 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 is it, <clears throat> what does it mean? It means that, uh, for example, if you, if you have field of view like like square, right, then you don't know if you count everything which is in this square, then you're covering the area which is bigger than the real square. You're counting all this object which is aside uh, that area. But if you put a rule that nothing which is which, not no structures which are touching the so called forbidden lines, these red ones, are counted and uh, uh, only structures which touching the uh, um, um, green light account counted, then you compensate for this strange problem. You are estimating uh, number of objects exactly in this area. So that's how it's applied. So if you have your structures not touching borders or touching green borders, then, then they're counted. But if they're touching the red one, they're not counted. And that compensate actually makes your estimation much more robust. And if you imagine that actually, if, if you already have three dimensional volume, like a stack of sections, this principle could be applied as well. In this case, it is uh, called unbiased counting brick. So you can go through your stack of sections and count all objects which are appearing or disappearing. And this way you duplicate volume because you have both ways and you can see how many objects in a certain volume are present. And this is numerical uh, density. And as soon as, you, as soon as you know this numerical density, then uh, if you already estimated volume density and surface density, you can see that they relate to the same volume. So you have certain volume, a certain number. And if you join these numbers, what you'll get, you'll get average volume or average surface per uh, your structure. And uh, that's an um, important thing to, to understand that you, you very often you need number for uh, estimation of average sizes of your sample, of your uh, uh, features. 
Here we are. Uh, so uh, this uh, I'll tell a bit about the Cavalieri method, which I mentioned before. It's a guy from 17th century, and he combined if this methodology where we estimate the volume by exhaustive cutting and uh, estimating the, vo the the area of this uh, um, <clears throat> of these cuts, and then multiplied by the distance between cuts, you're getting the volume of your sample. If you combine it with test points, you get very efficient estimation of the volume and could be again used in, in, in a stacks of sections, not only um, in a um, uh, single, uh, it's going to be used in single sections, but you could combine with single sections as well. And here we have an example and where the estimation of uh, saying lung could be done macroscopically by Cavalieri method and can you mute yourself yeah and, and then uh, <clears throat> you can divide the pieces of lung to smaller smaller fractions and if you have the record of this fractionation ratio then even if you in the end when you have images of uh, high resolution electron microscopy you count volumes of the cells numbers of the cells you can relate it to the total volume on the lungs. So you actually can estimate how many cells of certain types in the, in the total lung, uh, in the total lung uh, volume. So um, that is how s uh, methods could be combined. And also, uh, if, if you go to the stacks of sections, as we already mentioned several times, you uh, ha you can have additional amazing possibilities because you have the full volume. And very often, very often, you you do not want to reconstruct everything to estimate the volume because it's, it's quite laborious to segment. There is not automatic segmentation. And then um, uh, estimated from, from this computer reconstruction um, models. If you put the same kind of grid, but in 3D, like like depicted here, or uh, it may be done in more efficient way. Uh, so you have a grid going in all three axes, or all three directions, and you have a bit of uh, variability to, to, have, to have the uh, random rotation. So you can put it in, in random positions over volume. What you can do, you can determine uh, from, from without any reconstruction, you can determine the surface of your object in, in the stacks of sections. And it could be stacks of electron microscopy sections, could be uh, light microscopy sections. It, it's, it's, it's practically the same. It even could be geological material. The last thing I'll talk about uh, uh, is the length. Very often lengths, uh, if you have completely only two-dimensional se section, which is usually not true because all this has a volume, then there is no problems. You can have the count the intersections between the cells, between the, 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 the plane of section and the long structures. But if you have a volume, then things become a bit complicated. Then you need to care about uh, how your uh, plane will go in three dimensions. And then you need to probably to have a very complicated algorithm in computer for the volume to generate this plane. There is much simpler solution. If you have the volume and you have these lines which represent some filaments and you use spherical probe. Spherical probe has uh, already embedded is a, is a tropic orientation. So all orientations are the same. And you put this probe through your volume, then you act in, in count the intersections between that probe, which is the, 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 the uh, sphere, the surface of the sphere and, and your filament, then you can estimate the length, total length of filaments in the volume. And it's actually e easier to do than, than represented here because uh, th this, the, this um, spherical probe could be represented by, by just by circles. And you, you can see that in serial sections, in a stack of images, you put circles of different diameter through all your stack and counting the intersections between the filaments and your probe, you get length. So stereology, when to use it? If you want to estimate ratios and total quantities from two dimensional sections, then this play, uh, time when to, you need to use it. If you don't want to uh, 
apply automatic segmentation because it doesn't work, then that's <clears throat> is is, is the, the possibility. You can estimate still geometrical properties of a sample, compare different samples, different experiments. If 3D volume is not transparent, then of course it's practically not possible to see what is inside. And uh, then that you need to use two-dimensional sections and stereology. And uh, again, relating to the three-dimensional volumes, if you don't want to reconstruct everything you have in your image stacks, you just can assess it with the stereological tools. And you need to do it properly. If you do want to estimate 3D properties, you need to precisely formulate what exactly do you want to measure. You need to think about what 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 is important because you don't want to repeat this uh, quite tedious and just clicking mouse. It could be quite quite boring. Then uh, please discuss it with me. We can design the best possible uh, case for 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 your uh, experiments and. Uh, of course, you need to perform pilot experiment because you can't, you, you just want, do not want to spend so much effort on full blown scale experiment and then say, oh, something went wrong. <clears throat> and of course, you need to find a person who will do all this mouse clicking for you because I will not do this. I can show how to do this, but I will not do any mouse clicking uh, for you. Uh, pilot is fine, but not full scale. And the important thing to remember is you need to do sampling in the right way. If you've done sampling and can come to me with your samples already done, I mean, you have selection, you have images, and you come to me and say, can I calculate something? Can I count something? I probably say, probably not, or not in a very good, very good way, because you need to think about stereology from the start of the experiment, well ahead of the full-blown uh, imaging. 